Hey, now that my mute is off. And, and we are recording at this time. Uh, we're going to wait for a few more folks to um, to show up. Um, but for those of us who are joining us at this time, we have on the line with us right now, uh, Mr. Hank Weisinger. Um, Hank is the son of uh, Mort Weisinger, who was the editor of DC Comics for Superman back during the Silver Age. A lot of the stuff that uh, Superman fans love today, uh, Supergirl, Crypto, uh, the Bottle City of Candor, the Phantom Zone, the Legion of Super. Hank's dad is the man who was responsible for all this. Um, this is the man that uh, helped to bring all about the Superman mythos uh, throughout the, uh, the 50s and 60s. Um, also, he was the man who came up with the idea for the imaginary stories which probably led to some of the best DC comics uh, throughout the 60s, in my personal opinion. Um, these are stories like, uh, what if Lex Luthor killed Superman? Or what if uh, Superman became Superman Red, Superman Blue? And these, these, these are stories I learned today as some of the best written of the Silver Age. And we are very honored to have Hank with us. And Hank, I was just want to say uh, we've got a nice little audience building and folks coming and talking with you. Oh, Hank, can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, I hear you fine. Okay, cool. Now, I was going to say, um, I was getting, um, checking some uh, internet connection here to make sure everything's fine. So, and looks like everything is good. Now, I was going to say we're close enough to start time. So, how about we, uh, how about we go and get started? Fine by me. Awesome. Well, um, we were talking a little bit uh, the other day about your dad. And one of the things about about your dad is, is there's not a lot of information out there about him. Um, you know, not, you know, and like I said, a lot of the guys who worked in DC Comics at the time and everything, you know, there's just not a lot, a lot of inf personal information about them out there. I was going to ask if you could tell us a little bit about, uh, about your dad's background, where he came from, and uh, if you, can tell us what got him into science. He was one of the first science fiction fans. Um, he's like one of the guys who really helped start early fandom, uh, fan, you know, science fiction fandom back in the 20s and 30s. And I was going to ask um, um, about your dad's background and what the, what got him into, uh, into the genre. Well, the uh, he grew up in the um, in New Jersey, and. Uh, I would say my grandparents at one point were uh, fairly affluent and then lost everything in the uh, depression. And um, as my father tells me, he got a illness uh, on his feet one time and he had to stay in bed for a year. And so he tells me, who knows whether it actually happened, but he did tell me he read the entire book of knowledge when he was uh, in bed for a year and he got very interested in uh, science. And his mother wanted him to be a doctor, um, but that wasn't really his interest. He actually had a friend who wrote a, uh, sold a story, a magazine article. And that's what really motivated. My father basically used, uh, I would call it social comparison. He said, if this guy can sell an article and make easy money, then I can do the same. And that's how he got into um, writing. And his first interest, and then he, he did write something, sold it, and he bought his first typewriter, which I actually still have. It's like an Underwood uh, typewriter. A lot of Superman stories were typed on it. And then he became interested in science fiction, and he was a um, childhood friend of Julie Schwartz, who I'm sure everybody knows that name, and they started a science fiction magazine for fans, and he used that. He was really, um, went beyond that. He started corresponding with a lot of the famous science fiction writers of the day and he got them to write articles and you know short stories 
Uh, and then he became an agent. And he started selling their stories rather than just printing them himself. And science fiction was really his first uh, his first love. He didn't really like he he liked the knowledge of science, but he didn't really want to uh, apply it except in his imagination. One of, one of the things he really contributed to Superman was that scientific explanations of many things. You know, is why Superman has powers from the red sun, you know, uh, from an orange sun instead of a red sun, and 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 so on. And then the more he got into science fiction, he, you know, and he kept contact. He, as you know, he brought a lot of these science fiction writers into doing Superman. He always had great confidence in them. Ed Hamilton, Otto Binder, these were really good people compared to what he felt the writing talent of many of the just straight Superman, um, you know, writers, which caused him a lot of, uh, caused him a lot of stress. So then he, um, went into the, uh, army and, uh, he was, he was writing a lot of magazine articles. A lot of people don't know that they think of him just in terms of Superman. But he wrote about 3000 magazine articles for things like Reader's Digest, Collier's cover articles, Saturday evening post and so on. So when he was in the army, he, be, they made him a cook. So he wrote an article called I Was a Rookie Cookie, mm -hmm. and they uh, sent him to work in public relations at Yale, where he worked on Stars and Stripes with Glenn Miller. Yeah, Bill Holden, William Holden was his roommate, Broadway Crawford, and so on. And naturally, as the years went by, you know, 30 years later, when I can assure you many of these people forgot who my father was, but anytime we saw a movie with one of these characters in it or Highway Patrol, I'd have to hear, you know, the 20 minute story, his recollections of how he was friends with these people and yada, yada, yada. And then when he came out of the army, he went back to um, Superman. And then the rest is, uh, the rest was history. As he started to get more and more power in the Superman uh, you know, organization. He started uh, taking taking control. He was an idea machine, and that is really why he could not be stopped. There, there will never be an editor at DC that has that much power ever, ever again. That's one of the re that's one of the things I think that DC learned when uh, you know he was gone, never to give one person so much uh, authority because he did use it. Well, the thing is, your your dad, in my opinion, was able to use it to a good advantage. Um, like I said, the the comic book industry, when um, the 1950s, for folks who aren't familiar with it, um, by 1954, you had set investigations. You had people that were wanting to shut down the industry. They thought comic books were uh, corrupting kids. They thought they were bad influence. Um, for folks who don't know about the Seduction of the Innocent, it was a book written by Dr. Frederick Warham. And Warham right. wrote about how comic books cause juvenile delinquency because every yeah, juvenile delinquency. You know, my father, yeah, oh, when, when my father debated with him. So when he made that comment that uh, juvenile delinquents read Superman, my father's response was, yeah, they also drink milk. Yeah, that's, that's the thing Warham didn't get is that every juvenile delinquent in America read comic books, but every straight A student in America read comic books. Every Boy Scout read comic books. It, it's like saying every juvenile delinquent watches television. It's like every kid watches television or goes on the internet. Uh, it's just it's just one of those things where I think he just didn't see the big picture that comic books appealed to all children. But Correct. Uh, I know that children is the appropriate phrase because my father used yeah. to tell me that 60 million eight-year-olds were his boss. <laughs> Well, we talked about that the other day about how that attitude has changed a lot with a lot of writers and editors today who seem to think they have no obligation to the customer. And I, I always appreciated that about your dad is that he was always thinking in terms of entertaining the kids who read the comics. And I think that's one of the things that yeah. made the books five, whereas other comics didn't, is he. I, I think it was because he used his authority and used his power wisely to make Superman one of it, it was the best selling time as far as superheroes went. 
And that's one of the reasons I think DC survived, um, whereas other comic book companies went under as far as superheroes. I mean, you had Timely eventually becoming Marvel Comics, but there's a reason why the Captain America books didn't weren't published throughout the 1950s or Submariner. It took time for them to come back. But Superman has that uh, wonderful run that's gone from 1938 to the present day. And probably the most recent thing with the uh, COVID-19 was probably the only thing that's really caused the disruption in publishing any of the Superman comic books. Right. I, I mean, I can assure you if he was still doing it, he would have stories about that, of how Superman has to stop the virus. Well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to address that idea that uh, you were talking about the way your dad thought. Uh, he was he was writing these for for the kids, and we we had that wonderful conversation where you were talking about uh, the Metropolis mailbag, where he was getting his ideas from the kids who were writing in, and, and so that's where what was generating a lot of the ideas. So tell about. Yeah, I, I would say that was really the the uh, source for creating the Superman mythology. Kids would ask questions. And then he would have to come up with the answers, uh, you know, he'd make them up and then they would be incorporated into the, um, you know, super, Superman lore. And, and I get as an example, you know, dear editor, where does Superman keep his clothes, his Clark Kent clothes when he changes? Uh, and then he said, oh, he's got a pouch in the back of uh, his cake. But he didn't think of having a pouch before that question was, you know, was asked. So a lot of the questions would stimulate uh, him to create the answers then would help develop the, you know, the mythology. For example, you know, how come um, when his rocket crashed or something, or how come it, when he uses his x-ray vision, it doesn't break his glasses or whatever. And then the answer, of course, because Ma Kent made his glasses out of the window that was in his rocket from Krypton. So it became, uh, you know, invulnerable. They have things like, you know, like that. One of the most famous, uh, there was a story, do you remember, called the Great Boo Boo Contest, where they put errors in, and the contest was who could, who could find the most mistakes. Do you remember that story? I remember that one, yes. Mm -hmm. And the kids who won were actually, it was a bunch of kids from MIT. They actually found mistakes that my father didn't even realize he had put in. And one of them said, dear editor, uh, you say Superman could fly faster than the speed of light. But according to Professor Einstein's theory of relativity, that is impossible. Please explain. So his response was, what Einstein says is theory, Superman's speed is fact. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Well, I, I did want to ask also, uh, we were talking a little bit that uh, you actually got a chance to give some input into your, your dad's comics also. You said that your dad would often ask you about ideas and covers and such, right? Every morning, I didn't have an alarm clock for school. He would walk into my room, shaving cream on his face, and every single morning, for years and years and years, his first thing to me was, how's this for a cover? And, and the rule of thumb was, or he'd tell me a story. If I could guess the ending, he'd throw it out. Wow. You also told me a great story about how if you came up with an idea and they wanted to credit it to a kid, he would actually use your friend's names in the comic books. Or they, would, they were like... Oh, yeah. That, that, that would be a big thing. Whenever he wanted to, you know, make up a letter, he would sign one of my friend's, you know, name. And it would be a big thrill for them to see their name in a uh, in a Superman comic. Well, I was going to ask when I mean this talking... is how this is how he discovered Jimmy Shooter. Everybody knows his name. Oh yeah. He gets a letter, an idea, my father was so impressed with it. He sent the guy, he said I'm going to buy this $25 and if you have anything else, send it to me. And then the next thing he got from Jim was not just an idea but actually the artwork. You know, he did the whole thing. And when my father saw that, he didn't really know. He was just a kid. Uh, he invited him to New York for a summer job with his, you know, his mother came. And that was the beginning of how Jim Shooter got into uh, DC Comics. 
I was going to say the uh, other great talent. The other great talent that he discovered like that was a guy named Carrie Bates. Do you know that name? Yes, uh, I, I'm actually. I'm actually. Carrie. Carrie is the guy that actually got me into wanting to write comic books when I was a kid. Right. Uh, I, I loved his run on the Flash and Superman comics yeah, he, also. He was very talented. Yeah, I was going to say. I was going to ask about that because I remember. I was going to ask about Carrie because I remember he he got started by pitching ideas for covers for the Superman covers. Uh-huh. Like I think the first one he did was the one with Luther and Brainiac where Superman's been shrunk down to size in the birdcage. An interesting story about Brainiac. The, my father comes home and he shows me a letter from a computer company that says you can no longer use Brainiac because we had the copyright uh, you know, for their computer company. So the way my father resolved that is he turned Brainiac into a computer. Interesting because I remember the first first couple of appearances. It seemed like he was more humanoid than than robot. Right. That, that's, that's the only reason he was a computer to avoid a lawsuit. Awesome. This is, this is I I never realized that. I remember the the appearance changed. I remember they made him more. Um, it seemed like they made him a little bit more robotic looking in the comics. Right. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Well, I was going to ask um, about some of the the characters and situations that. Um, your dad helped to develop for the Superman comic books, how some of these characters came about. Um, I guess starting with, say, Crypto, I can imagine there are a lot of kids wondering, why does Superman have a dog? Uh, right. We used to have a big German shepherd that lived in, in the house behind us, and the dog would always get through the hedges, and um, my father did not like the dog. He, he was not a dog lover but he knew that kids liked dogs and uh, that's why they needed crypto. And he did a lot of, crypto became very popular. Now, one time I will tell you, the owner of DC Comics at the time, the national periodicals, Jack Lee was one of them, was a big uh, Cleveland Indian fan. Mm-hmm. So he had season tickets uh, for the Yankee games that were about eight rows behind the visiting teams dugout, which was great for me because I went to, you know, all these Yankee games and had great seats. So one time, and there were four seats in the box. So one time my father and I are there and there are these two other people there uh, of a, um, you know, at the time, considering, you know, the cultural context, you would not see Hispanics in those seats. So my father was wondering, how did they get these seats? You know, somebody obviously gave them the tickets. And it was a father and his son who was basically, you know, my age, maybe like 10 years old. So when they, they start, my father started talking about Superman to the 10 year old. And he said, who's your favorite character? And the kid kept saying, crap though. And it took my father about three innings to figure out that the kid meant crypto. That's how he was pronouncing him. And that became sort of like a, a joke between between us. Oh. Well, I was going to say, I know, I know as a kid, um, like I said, I always, I, like I said, I, I remember having my first dog when I was a kid and loving it. And I remember being yeah, and then that was Super, a, and then, Right, but once Superman, then it became kids would ride in the Supergirl habitat. And therefore, the birth of a Streaky or yeah. Common came into you know, came into play. Yeah. Well, eventually, you eventually you had like the Legion of Super Pets, which was basically all the Superman animals, and then um, me and uh, Chameleon Boys, uh, shape shifting uh, pet. Mm-hmm. Well, so I, 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 I do have to ask how the Super Monkey came about. That was the Super Monkey. That I do not remember. I can't help you there. <laughs> no problem. No, I, I always, I, I always it might have been something that was sent in a uh, uh, in a rocket ship or something from Krypton. Like I think Jor-El was an early version or something, or sent up a rocket, and that was. I think that's where how Super Monkey came out. Well, no, I, I used I used to kid with people. It's like you know, Batman's cool and Batman can do this, but Batman never had a pet monkey. Superman, Superman had a pet monkey, so that, that's what makes <laughs> Superman cool, in my opinion. Well, now speaking of baseball, uh, you you sent me some wonderful artwork, and when we post this on 
Facebook, uh, we're going to share the artwork that uh, that Hank sent us. He, he sent us some beautiful covers, uh, original covers from his dad's collection, and also a wonderful uh, baseball piece that I'd, I'd like you to tell everybody about, um, uh, the Mickey Mantle story. Well, I was a big Yankee fan, and actually Mickey Mantle replaced me, became my hero more than more than Superman. And as I mentioned, we had season tickets, and I had read in the paper that they were going to have a Mickey Mantle Day, uh, September 10th. So I had my father, I said, I want those four tickets. So he had also, he, he was also, besides the running Superman, he was also the VP, he ran public relations for DC. Like when, Super, when George Reeves was on Lucy, that was my father arranged that. When he was, do you remember the show? Do you remember the show Masquerade? I've heard of it. I've never seen it, but I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Masquerade was like on a Sunday night where they would have somebody come out and they'd be in a costume, and then you had to guess who who it was. So they got George Reeves on, and my father came up with the idea that his costume would be a giant Kent box of cigarettes, like he was inside the, oh the you know the Kent box, right? So. Um, so for Mickey Mantle Day, he figured out that he'll have an artist draw a picture of Superman from all the, you know, of Mickey Mantle. And then I would get out, go out on the field and get to present it as was the custom people going out and giving him gifts and so on from different organizations as representative of all these Superman fans. And he used to tell me every time we went to a ball game, he said it would take 60 Yankee stadiums to fill up all the people who, you know, read, read Superman. So he brought it home one night. Wayne Boring, who signed the picture, uh, did the artwork. And when I saw it, I started to cry because I thought it was terrible. And I couldn't see Mickey's number seven and so on. So my father got so frustrated, he said, forget it. And I ended up keeping it. Now I'm glad that that, that happened. It's like I said, I and, and the caption, the caption was supposed to read where the ball is going on Superman's hands and bouncing out of the stadium. The caption was supposed to read, uh, not even Superman can catch a ball hit by Superman. You know, a similar story. Like said, do you remember the super right? Do you remember the Superman play? Yes. On Broadway? So, um the the Broadway play. Yes. Right. So the um I'm listening to WABC radio, Cousin Brucey at the time, and they announced on ABC that they're going to have a contest. Whoever can draw the best picture of Superman will get free tickets to the preview of the play. So I tell my father, and he says, don't worry about it. So meanwhile, for those who don't know, the people who wrote the Superman play had just come off doing uh, Bye Bye Birdie, and the book was by the same people who did Bonnie and Clyde. And the producer was uh, Harold Prince, who had just come off uh, Fiddler on the Roof. So it, so it had a lot of power associated with it. And these people were up in my father's office for like three weeks, you know, learning the character and questions and so on. So he brings home, he says, here's your entrance. And it was uh, done by Kurt Swan. So you see Superman, Superman flying in the background. In the middle, there is a guy sitting on a shack with a fiddle. And in the foreground, there is a guy who looks like uh, Tevi from Fiddler. And the guy on the shack is saying, Tevi, where in the good book does it say a man can fly? And Tevi says, not good book, you fool, comic book. And now it's a Broadway musical. Now you have to realize the artwork, as I said, done by Kurt Swan. So you can't get you can't get it any better. That's true. And the caption, the idea, is by the guy who does this for a living. So my father said, if we don't win, you know, it's a fix. How can this not win? <laughs> so about I and at this time you have to realize I started to believe that I did this. I would take it to school, show my friends, you know, and so on. Mm -hmm. So about three days after I send it in, I get a phone call. Is this Hank Weisinger? Yes. Are you over 18? Yes, which I wasn't. And he said, well, you just won two free tickets to Superman preview. 
So my sister and I go, and it, all the ABC disc jockeys were there. And at halftime, you know, they had a bar set up, and they had all these Superman pictures all over the place by little kids. And right behind the bar was my masterpiece. My, my only regret was that I didn't get it back. Oh, what would that be worth today? I can only imagine. And I, I'm just, yeah. I'm, I can imagine the producers probably kept that because, I mean, that's, I, I would certainly hang on to something like that because I can, that, right. that's what I'll say, like as a comic, comics historian, that's the kind of thing I would, that's the kind of thing you, you love finding out about and would love to see in person because, what I, I, I was going to ask, uh, what, what do you, you know, know? a lot of people, because one of the things that anybody who has read about my father, they know that there are many comments that uh, are not kind. And yet, I would say they were all true. That in terms of his staff, he was incredibly abrasive. He would be now, as I went into the corporate world in my own work as a psychologist and seminars on giving and taking criticism and so on. And one of the most frequent questions would be, how do you criticize the abrasive boss? And that's what his staff didn't know how to do. But he was very uh, demanding, hypercritical, uh, abrasive. The attitude was clearly, if you don't like it, leave. Because his only mission was to make Superman successful. You know, now I believe that when somebody writes a comic, they get credit for it, like the writer's name is on it. That was not going to ever be the case with Superman because my father wanted Superman to be the star. He did not want the writer or even the editor for that thing to be the uh, star. You know, his, his name didn't appear in the masthead until maybe 15 years after it should have been. And that was a big argument in that he had to really, you know, fight for that. As many at times as the artists and the writers would say negative things and how he would always fight with them. He also, what they didn't know, he would also fight with the executives about getting them, about getting them more money. That's what people really, uh, you know, uh, went un, unnoticed. His whole relationship with DC was always filled in a sense of, conflict, which is probably one of the reasons he started to get some, um, you know, health, health problems. It was a tremendous sense of pressure. As I tell people, you look at a show like Seinfeld or Bonanza, or even Twilight Zone. I've been watching a lot of Twilight Zones lately, and I have to tell you, a lot of them are terrible. Absolutely terrible. The difference is there's maybe 15 great episodes that everybody remembers. So when people would say, oh, with Superman, more Weisinger, he rehashed stories and so on. Uh, well, Seinfeld did that for 10 years. Whatever, whatever story incident happened to George, it happened to Elaine or it happened to Jerry. And every Bonanza episode, okay, so little Joe falls in love with somebody and they die. Well, and then Adam Cartwright falls in love with somebody and they die and so on. I will tell you that if he was responsible for only one Superman story a week, there never would have been a bad Superman story. Ever. So he, he, he had to come up with 30 stories a month for 30 years. Obviously, there are going to be rehashes and so on and, and covers. I mean, how many times people post, you know, their covers on the Facebook page? And I'm, I've, seen, I've seen this, you know, 10 times. He, he used to call it the switcheroo. <laughs> well, and he taught me that as a valuable lesson, to be able to pick a subject. And then when you write about it, be able to come up with 10 or 11, uh, you know, different, you know, different angles. So I did that with the subject of criticism, you know, for parents, criticizing your kids, sexual criticism, criticism at work. He, he taught me how to get a lot of mileage out of one idea. Well, we were talking about this, um, Julie, Julie Schwartz, when he introduced the idea of uh, rebooting the flash for, for showcase, um, Julie had the theory that most kids start reading comic books when they're around six or seven years old, and they start to outgrow it by the time they're 12 or 13. So the lifespan of the average comic reader was maybe five to six years if you were lucky. But then their little brothers and little sisters or their little cousins start reading comic books. And Julie's idea was that by the time they rebooted The Flash in 56, every kid that would have read the Jay Garrett comics was already 
outgrown comic books. So they weren't even going to be pitching to them anymore. They were going to be pitching to a brand new audience. So in a lot of ways, your your dad's idea that, well, we did, if a story may have been done in like 57, it's okay because the kids who were reading in 57 aren't going to be reading them in 68. I, I think maybe they might have underestimated the fact that you did have some adult fans that were, that were carrying over. And plus, I don't think any of these guys could have foreseen um, back issues and reprints and these things being archived today. Uh, back, back in the right. day, if you wanted to find a Superman comic book from two mm-hmm. months ago, it was probably impossible. Nowadays, finding one from 30 years ago, all you have to do is go on Amazon and just collect whatever collection is, is currently available. Right. You know, one funny thing about that, do you remember, this might have been before your time, but there was a uh, show called The Loretta Young Show? It was before my time, but I I have seen some episodes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so one time there was a Loretta Young show where um, she meets like an artist, and the artist says, oh, you're my fantasy, and he shows her a picture, like a portrait of her and so on. And the guy's really a con artist. Anyway, to make a long story short, my father took that and he turned it into a Lois Lane story. So he gets a letter one time from this kid. It says, dear editor, he says, the other night I was watching Loretta Young show and they, they had the same story that you had in Lois Lane. They stole your idea. We laughed. The kids saw the rerun of Loretta Young. It was actually just the just the opposite. So my father wasn't above not taking borrowing, as he would say it. And uh, yet I found the you know the, the same idea. Uh, people write about the same ideas. That's a big thing in science fiction. You know who thought of it. And anytime you find something that is good, somebody else will say, "Well, this person wrote the same story, you know, uh, ten years ago." It's very hard to be original. And you were talking about. And that was one of my father's things. Every time, like, he would say something to me as a joke and whatever. Like, we would play cards every night. This is one of the reasons I was not a great high school student. We played gin and chess till like two o'clock in the in the in the morning. And the deal would be, if I won in cards, he'd pay off. But if I lost, I didn't have to pay because he'd just be taking back his own money anyway. So every time he would get gin, he would say like ginaroo and lay down the cards. And then I would say that when I won, and his first comment was, can't you be original? <laughs> well, I did, I did want to address the idea about what you said about your about your dad. Um, yeah, I remember reading uh, stories about your dad being your dad. <laughs> and uh, but, it, but again, I, I always try to put things in the context of history. And I know, like I said, this he was coming in at a time when comic books were they were still considered junk culture. And again, a lot of folks don't understand how close the industry came to shutting down. Um, really DC with Superman and the properties they had like Bob Hope comics and uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis comics, the, the licenses they were able to get from um, uh, movie stars and television performers was one of the things that kept the, allowed them to hang on. And then Dell comics, uh, which was like the only company that actually, um, wouldn't agree to the, the comics code because they said, well, Disney is letting us publish stuff. So, you know, it's going to be wholesome and family, family friendly, but there are so many companies that were just barely hanging on Atlas. There's, there's, I've heard stories about um, Stan Lee, uh, Martin Goodman coming in and finding like a closet full of artwork from stories they were never going to publish because Stan didn't have the heart to fire artists and he was still giving them out assignments, even when they knew they didn't have enough, books to put all the material out there so i can understand having this huge property that is basically carrying the entire company i can i can imagine that's that's a lot of pressure on your dad and again even even if it is a lot of people are saying it is junk culture it has to be the best junk culture out there and um so i can understand you you want to strive for excellence you want to get the best stories you can you want to get the best artists you can and it's something a lot of people don't talk about is the fact that um, your dad kept a lot of the guys on there. I mean, guys like Kurt Swan, uh, Wayne Boring, he was keeping them on there on the books and the writers and giving them assignments. Like you said, he was fighting for them behind the scenes because I think he knew he had the best guys in the industry at that time. 
Yeah, when my fa- when my father fired Wayne Boring, hmm? Wayne could not believe it. He said, are you, are you, "You're firing me," and my father's response was, "You need a punch in the stomach to tell you that you're not wanted here." Wow. Do, do you know what uh, what caused him to fire? I mean, my father's fantasy was to get into a debate with Don Rickles. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He he, well, he was a master at insulting, but in his eyes. They were always what he called clever insults. Yeah. Well, I, I did want to ask, uh, you brought up the I Love Lucy episode. Uh, what can you tell us about that, about how that came about? Because that's, that's the first time I'm hearing that, uh, that your dad was involved with that. Yep, Lucy was a uh, was like one of the top shows. Mm-hmm. Superman was flying high. And he, as I said, he was in charge of public relations. So he knew some people, you know, from um, the Superman TV show and made contacts and so on and came up with the idea of having Superman be at little Ricky's birthday party. And that was a big, um, a, you know, that was a very popular, that was a very popular show, that episode. Well, I was going to say for, for folks, hopefully, uh, hopefully there are folks out there who do know I Love Lucy, uh, but folks who do not. That was one of the first shows that really broke down barriers, I think, for Hollywood. I, I know at the time there were there were actors that have they were said, well, if you do television, we're not going to let you do movies because they were they thought television was going to kill the film industry. Yeah, but that was the first one. I remember the Hollywood episodes they did, and you had these huge stars like yeah. William Holden and Rock Hudson right. and uh, Cornell Wilde. And that kind of opened the door and saying, well, yes, you can, you can be John Wayne and do an I Love Lucy episode and still be a movie star. And I always thought it was kind of, I always thought Superman, it was kind of great. Superman was, Superman was bigger than all of them. Yeah. Well, I always thought it was great that he was like the last, I think he was like the last major guest they had on the show. Um, yeah. Because it's where they did the whole moving to Connecticut thing and then the last season and all. So. Right. Me, meeting George Reeves was a big thrill. It still is very clear in my mind. How he, he picked me up. He picked me up and he threw me in the air and caught me. I was going to ask if you ever had a chance to meet any of the cast members. So you did get a chance to meet George. I lived in California. It must have been about 1955. And we stayed at a hotel in Westwood that was called the Dracker Hotel. The highlight of the day would be my mother taking me to a thrifty drugstore. They had a counter and getting my chocolate ice cream soda. And my father would take me to the would take me to the set, and I remember being disappointed because I was there a whole day, but never saw him in his Superman costume. All I saw was the same scene of in his Clark Kent talking to um, Harry White, uh, you know, over and over and uh, over. And I got to meet Noel Neal and Jack Larson. Noel Neal was really nice. I liked her. I liked her a lot. She later went on the lecture circuit. To yes. um, you know, uh, make some bucks. I was gonna say, uh, Noel. You know, when, Super, when George Reeves committed suicide, I always remember the headline. My father told me he didn't commit suicide; he went back to Krypton. Hmm. But uh, how how old were you when grade. when George when George died? I was in sixth grade. I I remember reading all these stories about kids waking up and seeing the headlines because yeah. His his girlfriend, who ironically had an LL uh, yeah. name, I think her name was Linda Lenore or something. Lenore um, Lemon, yeah. Yeah, was spreading it around Hollywood that he was not a Superman. And that got to him. Regardless of what you saw in that Hollywood movie or, or whatever. That was one of the reasons. And he was typecast. Yeah. He couldn't get because anything he would want to do. You know, remember he was in what from here to eternity and gone with the wind uh-huh. and uh he wouldn't be able to get a job. This was one of the things that Sean Connery, for the same reason, stopped doing James Bond. Well I was gonna say I remember reading um there's a there's a great book out called Hollywood Kryptonite that explores um what happened with him. And I know there's a lot of theories. There, there is a theory about him committing suicide, and then there's also the theory about uh, being uh, having having spurned 
the ex lover and everything. And mm -hmm. I know and it's one of those things that even to this day, there's still questions that um, are about it because, like I said, there are some folks that believe he did kill him. He killed himself. None of the folks thought he was executed uh, for crossing the wrong person. So it's just, uh, it's just, it's really a shame because, like I said, I mean, for George, um, I was telling some friends earlier that uh, my my parents we didn't go to the movies when I was a kid. So Christopher Reeve, I didn't really discover until I was like 10 or 11 years old. So for me. George and Danny Dark from the Super Friends were, that was my Superman when I was a kid. Because I remember watching mm -hmm. the, the episodes and and all. But it's wonderful you got a chance to meet him because I, I heard he always had a great uh, reputation with kids. He was always very friendly with children. Yeah. And I remember reading... Um, yeah, he was discovered on the beach for Superman. And, and it was like he, he, it was described as he coming right out of the comic book. Well, I, remember, I remember Kurt Swan for several years drawing him, in the 50s especially, drawing him like uh, like George. And then when Christopher Reeve came out, that's when they started making him more look like Christopher Reeve from the movie and all. So. Mm -hmm. But no, he, he was definitely the Superman for so many people and uh, for, a lot of, for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say, um, I'm looking at the time, and we were wanting to try to wrap up about 12.45, but I wanted to open up the floor to anybody that may have some questions. Um, I was going to say, we've got everybody on mute, uh, but if you guys want to use your chat feature, uh, if you have any questions for us, by all means, please send them to the chat, and I'll be happy to pass them along, and we can do that for a little bit. In the meantime, I did want to ask you, uh, we were talking a little bit, you said that your dad was constantly waking you up in the morning to ask you questions and such uh, about, about the comics and your opinion. You told me that you thought the book started declining when you went to college and he didn't have you there for, for his idea man, right? Correct. And at that time, he was starting to get burned out. He had just written a novel or was it a novel that was called The Contest, which was about Miss America. And he had other um, aspirations. You know, one of his things, if you remember, I think I mailed it to you, the uh, Superman cover where Clark is walking out on Superman and get yourself a new identity. I'm sick of this and so on. Mm -hmm. That was exactly how he was feeling. Well, we were talking also um, about, um, you said that folks would you'd go on vacation and within minutes people would know who your dad was because he, he was very proud of being the Superman editor. Yeah, I wouldn't say that it was a sense of being proud. He knew it would impress other people it lead to uh, lead to perks. He lost his wallet one time at the Little Neck Theater in Long Island, and the owner found it. And when he was looking to see who it belonged, he came across his business card. And uh, from that point on, every movie we went to see at that theater, we got in for free. Wow. Well, I'll be I'll be honest. I, I can't blame your dad for being proud. I, it's like I said, if I was editing Superman or writing Superman, I'd have T-shirts made up going "I write Superman," and I'd make up T-shirts saying "I met the guy who writes or edits Superman," and pass him out. <laughs> it, it, it it was great in terms of when we used to get into debates of whose father had the better job or the most status, because nobody could respond after I said, "Well, my father's the editor of Superman." Yeah, that was a lot better than saying my father's a cardiovascular surgeon. Who cares when you're ten years old? That's true. Well, I was I was gonna say, um, how 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 did um, how did other kids react when they found out who your dad was? They um, they loved it. I mean, the best thing I went to camp once and I hated it. the uh, The idea of waking up at, to a bugle at seven thirty and making my own bed was incomprehensible to me. And the only good thing was, you know, they'd have a canteen in camp. My father would be sending me like 20 comics every every week. So I could then, I had no interest in these comics. So I would then be able to trade for, uh, you know, their canteen uh, tickets so I could get like candy and stuff like, and stuff like that. I was like the godfather. I controlled the comic industry at summer camp. I was going to say, you must be like the kid who, whose dad ran the candy store. It's like getting candy meant... That was nothing. I mean, you every got night, all the time, yeah. so. Every night he would come home with, you know, the latest comics. Why would I read social studies? There was no point in that. It was like after dinner, I'd go up and I'd read, and then my father would come in and say, and all these stories, you have to remember, I heard. 
So when I would see it come to print, it was like the seeing the vision realized. I can imagine that scene is like, are you reading the comic books or you're doing your homework? I'm reading, I'm reading the comic book down. I'm reading it right now. So like, you're doing your homework, aren't you? It's like, no, I'm, I'm reading I mean, the comic book honestly. Read those comic books. You know how, you know how when you go to the library and, and you're looking like a journal article or an old magazine and they have it bounded, they have like every year. Like here are all these the magazines from 1940 to 1941 and so on. Well, we used to have he used to bring home from every year the bounded uh, Superman comics. It was like, like they were volumes, like a year. He, each one would have a year, and and he he wrote an article on refrigerators. So the guy gave him a free refrigerator for the publicity that he, it was like a mini refrigerator that he would keep in his home office. There was no food in it. It was stuffed with comets, you know, and, and so on. There was nowhere else to put them. And I only wish that I had kept those volumes now because they'd be worth millions and millions of dollars. Well, uh, we, we, we do have a question um, from Christopher, uh, Christopher Butson. Um, Hank, did your father ever discuss any ways Judaism or being the son of immigrants influenced his work as a Superman editor. How Judaism? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because Superman couldn't get circumcised. I well, I, I remember. I remember. I think Mad Magazine actually addressed that. Uh, they they had what if Superman had been raised by Jewish parents, and they actually they actually did address that. So. Right, that would have been something. No, I, you know, he would he would try to keep anything controversial, whether it was like with, when we were coming into Vietnam, uh, religion, because he didn't want to alienate uh, anybody. So Superman really became, as everybody knows, all inclusive. I th I think there were many things um, in strips, you know, where Superman would preach uh, immigrants, we welcome everybody. He, he, they had a lot of inclusive uh, Superman ads where he was where he was a, a spokesman. Well, I'm, I remember um, there's there's a famous one um, that still gets posted on Facebook about uh, anyone you know Superman addressing a group of kids saying that anytime someone says that so and so is not American, they're wrong. Right. And right. And I think I think Superman's he's, he's like he's the perfect spokesman for for that idea. I mean, he he is the the American immigrant story. Oh yeah. Uh, he, the uh, yeah. I mean, I can only imagine what he would be writing uh, now in in this era. In fact, I have been thinking of doing a open ed thing for around the election time on who would Superman vote for, considering truth, justice, and the American way were the values that I grew up with. I think actually DC DC did address that at one time, and I, as I recall it correctly, Superman said that he knew who who was, who he was going to be voting for, but he would not say publicly because he thought that it was every every, it was every every citizen's right to keep you know keep it private who you voted for, but at the same time too he also thought there were so many people that would be influenced by him he didn't want to influence the election. So yeah. here's a here's something amusing that a couple of months ago, Liz Cheney, she made a statement that I found really offensive because it was, you know, false information. Now, she's the, she's from Wyoming. Now, when my father died, several universities asked my mother for his papers. And the two that were the most enthusiastic were Syracuse. So he gave a bunch of, she gave a bunch of stuff to Syracuse and the University of Wyoming. So I called up the University of Wyoming and I said, unless uh, Liz Cheney retracts that statement, I will be forced to take the um, collection back because my father could not stand that. So uh, I called up the biggest newspaper in Wyoming and I said, I think I got a story for you. And I told them what I was doing. Well, later that day it was on the front page of the Wyoming newspaper. And then it went viral. The New York times picked it up. Uh, Washington post, De Detroit free press 
you know, and if you if somebody says if you Google like Superman and Liz Cheney, that will that will come up. I never had any desire to take the papers back anyway. I didn't want them. In fact, I'm glad my mother did that because I can just see uh, he had all the um, volumes, all the editions of Wonder Stories, you know, Startling Stories, all those science fiction pulp magazines, and they were literally in mint mint condition. And I am really glad now that I don't have them because I never would have taken care of them. So I'm glad they're in universities where people can, um, you know, study them. I was gonna ask, um, did they also? And, have... and that's where the idea of the bug-eyed monsters came. Yeah. DEMs, as they used to, as they used to call them. And that's where he really got in the idea of the cover sells the story. First, come up with the cover, and then we'll do a story around it. The cover was the most important thing to him. Right. Um, I was going to ask the papers that your dad had. Uh, these including like early correspondence he had like with Julie Schwartz and like with uh, Jerry Siegel and such. When back when they were when they were fans. Uh, yeah, he's got a lot of the correspondence stuff and so on. Wow. My sister actually wrote an article on that for Alter Ego about her trip to uh, Wyoming. Like I said, as a, as a comics historian, that's the kind of stuff I would love to see because, like mm -hmm. I said, it's just, it, it fascinates me to, to read about the early days of fandom when things were first getting started. And, and again, we, we take for granted nowadays being able to come together online like this, but back in the day when the only way you could contact with another fan maybe is by writing them and having to wait days or weeks for, uh, for correspondence. And you may be that one kid that's growing up in New York City that's waiting for a kid from Cleveland to write you back because you haven't read the same issue of Amazing Stories and liked it. And you, you found right. that in soul. So in, in that regards, I think we're definitely living in great times uh, as far as being able to come together. And uh, again, that's, that's part of the whole um, spirit of this weekend. So. Hank, I was going to say, I, I just noticed the time. Uh, we, we've reached our, our end point. Uh, we've got to get ready for another uh, meeting coming up in about 10 minutes or so. Okay. But Hank, well, thank thanks you for having it. me. I enjoyed it. And if anybody needs to get a hold of me, you have my email. You can just, you know, pass it on. You got it. Um, and like I said, uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. Hank, again, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, thank you for being uh, thank you for being our first official guest uh, at the Superman Virtual Days. Okay. You take care, my friend. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Hi. And guys, I'm going to go and end the meeting right now. Uh, but like I said, we've got a meeting coming up very shortly with the Wade family. We're going to be talking to them about um, their comic oh, books. Connect now. <laughs> uh, we got a meeting coming up with the Wade family very shortly. You'll actually be able to see them, and uh, we invite you all to join us. And thank you for, for tuning in for our first uh, first guest of the day. And we wanted to invite you to come back and stick around because, like I said, we got some other great guests coming up today. It's going to be a lot of fun. See you guys. <laughs>